Margaret, thank you. Good morning, you everybody. Mind. What are you doing here so early in the morning? You must have a burning desire to know which way the price of drugs are going <laughs> and, and why they're going there. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. I hope we can have a, a, a chat to sort of demystify the question of how you know, drugs are, are priced and how it could be done in a better, better way. And I thought I would just start with the fact that I have to do a lot of these 8 a.m. calls, you know, these 8 a.m. meetings that Margaret Lowe organizes. Uh, and we come in and show up, and, and I try to be smart and swift. And, but I, I know, I hear that there's a new drug that Lily is producing that will make me even better and make everyone better out there. And, and I want to ask Henry Aaron, if there was sort of this new drug, like the 8 a.m. miracle drug that was coming onto market, that was whatever, how in a value-based world would you get that drug priced right? Henry? I think you've asked one of the hardest questions there is. Uh, and to drive home the point, I'd like to start with a simple, purely hypothetical, numerical example. Mm. Uh, let's suppose a new drug is developed that will be a benefit to 10,000 people a year who would, without the drug, die with certainty. With the drug, they will survive, on the average, for an additional 10 years. Mm. The drug cost, and this is not uh, far from actual cost, a billion dollars to develop, including all the tests. Each dose costs $1,000 to produce. One dose works in each of the 10,000 people, and it's under patent and is going to last for another, the patent's going to last for another 10 years. Now, you need one additional bit of information to do value-based pricing, and that is to know what the general accepted estimate of an additional year of life and normal health is. A lot of argument about mm. that. For simplicity, $100,000 a year. Mm. What is a fair price for that drug? It costs $1,000 to produce each dose. Remember, the knowledge, it's 8 a.m. The knowledge, the knowledge, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm doing it, if people are sharp in the morning. Uh, Some. <laughs> uh, it costs a billion dollars to develop, and somehow the drug company needs to recover those costs. And the value to each person who receives that is a million dollars. Hmm. Ten years of life worth $100,000 a year. That, incidentally, is the key piece of information that undergirds what's called value-based pricing of drugs. What is the value to the user of the drug? Now, I think choosing among those prices is the challenge for deciding how drugs should be priced. And my own view, for what it's worth, is that it would be an outrage to charge people a million dollars for that mm. drug. A thousand dollars is certainly not enough because the drug companies need to recover not just the cost of production, but also the costs of development. Somewhere in between is what a, I think is a reasonable cost uh, to charge for the drug under current arrangements. Now, mm -hmm. we could change the arrangements and have the public, the government, right. help fund development costs to a greater extent than they now do, mm -hmm. and that would change everything. But I would just like to pose that numerical example as a challenge no, I mean, to I, all I of think us that's a as to what the price way to would lay out be. The equities, but, but Gail, you, how, would you, how would you come in? Well, you, the, uh, I think that Henry has posed a very interesting question about value, value to the user. Is that, is that really what you want right. with regard to the pricing? The only minor qualification in the example that he didn't set up, but I know, I assume he'll agree to, is that it's not just a question of having the drug company be able to recoup the uh, total cost, yes. but it's of all of the drugs that never make it all the way through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, there are really three complications on the production side that you have so to worry about. So can I ask you, you know, how many it? drugs, on, on, on a cost basis of say one to 10, where mm -hmm. you've got you know, an aggregate amount of, of money and investment in drugs and you're getting returns, how many sort of bad drugs or ineffective drugs or declined drugs 
way down the system on, on say, right. a percentage basis? It's not that they're, it's the drugs that never make it from the time they are being thought about right. in the lab to actually make it to market because right. they fail at some point or they fail in clinical trials. What is, I've been surprised is there have been in the last few years a number of highly touted drugs that have failed in their uh, last phase mm. clinical trials, uh, which really is a very expensive problem for pharmaceutical companies when they have gone all the way there mm -hmm. uh, and then they blow up. I, I think the number of those that start off as a germ of an idea and actually get to market, one so out of ten, one out of eight. So you're critiquing Henry's picture because it's siloed just around that drug. It and wasn't not just that. It was just really to make the point right. that on average, you have to have companies be able to recoup the development they place in the ones that never make it as well as the one that makes it. So it was saying, I agree with the issue that he set up. Uh, it's just slightly more complicated. Uh, and when you look at rates of return or uh, return on uh, invested equity or however you want to look at the capital that's expended, it really has to be to try to think about comparably risky mm -hmm. industries. It's not the only thing you right, want to think right. about, but if you Either you change how you fund the development of drugs, as Henry uh, indicated, having more public involvement. We can debate whether that's a, that right. will be more productive or not. Right. Uh, or you have to recognize that it becomes a question of looking at the return on invested equity in high-risk drugs, including the uh, pharmaceutical area, or other places that people right. can invest their money if you want to get this kind of continued production right. of drugs that thank, like the hepatitis C drug thank, that actually cures. So Liz, I want to ask you, you're, you're at Johnson & Johnson and I've been interested in the, in the patient's place in this equation and how when one thinks about the drug industry and pricing, mm -hmm. when you begin to think about both value and patients and that part of the equation, how does the old pricing model need to change from your perspective? Well, first I want to respond to a couple okay. points that were made earlier. And but then make sure you answer yes, my question. Yes, <laughs> answer your question. This is Washington. You don't yeah. have to do that. Right. <laughs> um, so, so to the question, first of all, it, it, is, pay, it, it is the funding, the innovation that doesn't quite make it uh, to the finish line as well as future innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I can't speak to how other companies price their products, but um, at Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, as we think about pricing a new product, we think about value to patients. Mm -hmm. um, how does it, what does it represent over the standard of care? This new 8 a.m. drug, um, is there anything on the market today? Um, is it, you know, how does it compare to what's out there already? Um, the value to the system, um, mm -hmm. is it going to prevent a hospitalization? I doubt it in, in the case that you've outlined. Um, but, but looking at sort of value from across the spectrum, um, we think about access as well. So in, um, in the comments that Henry made, um, thinking about, um, you know, how are insurers going to pay for it? Are they going to pay for it? Um, do we have data that shows that, that it's economically um, um, relevant and important product? And uh, what, what, um, what are patients going to be asked to pay? So we think about patient access, and I think that's where patients come into our equation. And then that last piece is um, funding future innovation as well as, mm -hmm. as past innovation. And I will say we were one of the companies that had invested over a billion dollars in an Alzheimer's drug that failed. Um, so we were, you know, we've seen that up front, and that, was, that happened the first year that I joined the company. So very relevant, um, very relevant issue. So with all due respect, the process you just talked about to me sounds incredibly complex, and I'm sure yes. pricing is incredibly complex. And you're dealing with uh, a health and care insurance system and, and what we've now learned as there's been more and more focus on the ecosystem involved with pricing, that it's not just the branded drug or even the generic front face of the drug. There are all of these other, you know, back PBMs and other players that are involved in uh, adding costs. Um, <clears throat> I've spoken to Heather Bresch, uh, who's the uh, occasionally controversial CEO of Mylon uh, with EpiPen, and she said, you know, she's advocating right now for a lot more transparency that people, that patients, when they go, ought to know what the prescription price is going to be, that there ought to be more transparency in the system. Do you think, I mean, what I just heard you say is great, but I don't know how you would achieve transparency in that. Is that a goal of your industry? Or are you better off with things obfuscated and blurry? 
<laughs> well, nice you, when you put it that way. No. <laughs> um, well, well, first of all, I, um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend going on our website. We have put out a transparency report mm. and tried to explain the best we can a lot of the factors that go into how we think about drug pricing, how we think about access, um, and I think a number of companies are trying to do the same thing. So we would like people to better understand how things work today, and so that's what we tried to do with the report that we put out um, at the end of February. Um, and, you know, transparency, I guess, um, to whom? And, and one of the issues that, that we um, have been talking about is, you know, there's, there's a difference between the list price and the net price. And the list price is what everybody sees, um, a lot of outrage about the increases, um, but the list price is not um, what is actually paid. We, we rebate and discount that price and arrive at a net price. And I think describing that, um, that dynamic is something that we're trying to do. Um, I think one thing that's concerning to us and maybe one, one aspect that um, Ms. Brush is raising is um, the co-payments that patients pay. Is it based on the list price or the net price? And what we're finding is that a lot of times it's based on... Well, those co-pays that people are, 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 have been paying have been, have been rising dramatically, like the, the, the early payments. So the, their, their sensitivity to prices is felt more on the front end of the, of the pricing structure. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, and we're very sensitive to that, and we share patients' concerns. And is that concerns. your fault, or is that the insurance company's fault? So we don't set uh, mm. co-pays. We don't decide what um, patients pay when so they go. So the insurance when they company's go. the bad guy in this. Well, I don't look. I don't want to pay, point a finger, and I, I think it's actually not a productive way to have the conversation. So no, I would not mm. point the finger. But I think there needs to be more of a dialogue and a better understanding of how the system works. It's extremely complicated. Mm. I think the industry sees one part of it, the payer sees another, um, and. Patients, I think, have um, not necessarily been part of that equation and, and probably should be, um, should be brought into that conversation as well. Henry, who's the bad guy in the equation? I'm not going to say who's a, a bad guy in this situation, but I do want to go back to the numerical example I gave mm -hmm. because I'd like to apply what uh, the principles that were just uh, right. laid out. Um, here we have patients who will die if they do not receive this drug, they will live for 10 additional years worth $100,000 a year, that's a million dollars. Uh, if they receive the drug, they face a co-payment. Beyond that point, they face no charge at all. Hmm. Uh, and even if they're already at their stop loss level right. on their health insurance, they don't even pay the co-payment. Hmm. So, um, the drug company that has produced this drug worth a million dollars to people who are going to pay whatever the copayment is or less have an open tap on cash from the healthcare system. The question is, what price should they charge? Now, if they're thinking of their shareholders, they may behave like Martin Shkreli, which I think most people in this room would not endorse. I don't think you would, and I'm pretty sure Gail wouldn't either. But uh, the question is where in that million dollar range, above or below, they're not paying anything for these benefits, so uh, the insurance, broad insurance system is paying for them. How do you price that drug? I think this is one of the most vexing questions, uh, and it leaves a vast range to management discretion management ethics uh, and uh, poses an enormous public policy problem uh, for the healthcare system, for insurers and for government through Medicare and Medicaid who have an enormous influence on how drugs get paid for. Henry just raised yeah. implicitly uh, two points I, I'd like to elaborate on. Uh, in using the Martin Shkreli uh, example, uh, or the Mylan uh, example, those are cases where it's not Mylan's more complicated because of the mecha injection mechanism, but particularly in the, in the other, um, these were not protected on patent. It's mm -hmm. actually a different problem, mm -hmm. and it's a problem if the government wanted to be more pro proactive, it could. Uh, if you get a small use drug that is off patent, generic, and you have somebody just uh, increase the price in a, uh, an extraordinary way. Right. You could imagine a world in which the government actually pays a competitor to come in to be a second producer 
uh, although what we have seen happen frequently, not surprising, is tremendous pressure on the individuals who act in such an anti-social way. It's one market when you have something on monopoly. And one of the challenges that goes on in new innovative prescription drugs mm -hmm. is the government is granted a monopoly. Now they do that because if you don't have intellectual protection, you're not gonna have the investment so that you have a chance to recoup it. But once you grant the monopoly, then, and if it's really a monopoly, there really isn't a competing drug uh, like Henry's ex example, um, then you have this dilemma that the monopolist could behave in a not very socially consumer way, thinking of very short-term profits. Generally, companies have longer-term views. They know, first of all, the government can find ways to get you when you behave uh, in antisocial ways, and that this is this year, but they're worrying about three years, five years, 10 years down the road, and so typically don't want to grab all of the consumer surplus in us economist terms that is generated, not all of the value or in their than, pricing, or more, more than. than. We, we, we could do a whole college course on this, and I want to <laughs> break out of, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of this, but I, I'm really interested in how we move from where we are now into something more healthy, uh, that takes in one of the new one of the new discussions start. is on well better information one of the discussions is on value based pricing and how to get that right communication when you you know talk both about the efficacy of drugs that kind of circle uh, of information of looking at how drug industries work with insurance industries and look with patient outcomes that is something that's being looked at I know at, at J and J but also in other other firms out there and and I'm interested in whether or not that might be a compelling alternative uh, a, as a framework. Uh, and Henry, I know you don't necessarily think so, but I'd like to hear for Gail for a minute whether or not that represents a real alternative to kind of all of the problems that you were just describing in these kind of, you know, incumbent monopolists. And, you know, I get all that. Yeah. But, but if you're going to move into something new, what would that new infrastructure begin to look like? Well, for me, uh, something, this is an issue I've discussed actually with Johnson & Johnson about 10 years ago, comparative effectiveness research would be enormously helpful. That is showing uh, who, what kind of groups benefit uh, relative from taking from one drug or another or an in intervention versus a drug, a surgical procedure versus a drug. And how would drug. you have that affect price? Um, well, the question as, the, as a payer, if it doesn't do more, should you pay more than the going market? When it does more, that's when it becomes more complicated of saying, yes, you can justify a higher price, there's no great gui guidance about how much. The real question in my mind is, who should pay for the comparative effectiveness research? Mm -hmm. It will take two or three years after an FDA drug approval until you've got enough okay. market experience so that you can say, yes, this drug is uh, significantly better, modestly better, 3% better, or, or no better than the existing drugs that are out there. Mm -hmm. and for me, that's the easy case. You can be out there, but there's no reason to reimburse at a higher rate. Right. Uh, it, and because there are competitive products, you really don't have uh, this real monopoly. Liz? We do a lot of that research, actually, but a lot of it we're not allowed to talk about with payers. Um, there are certain restrictions on what information we can share and what information we can't. So Why? Um, <laughs> well, that's a good question. I think under certain regulations, um, you know, the information that we produce and what we can share, if it looks like it's um, marketing off-label, for example, um, or going beyond what the label prescribes, then we've got to be really careful about that. So. Um, so I think, but we do a lot of the um, comparative effectiveness um, data and research now. But do you think that that inability to communicate creates an impediment to a more successful system that needs to be reviewed? I, I, I want to, I mean, if you were to take a shot at the FDA today, what would you say? Well, first of all, we support the FDA, okay. so, so I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> so we, we, a lot of right. FDA people in the audience were right. thrilled. Financially so, as yeah. well as in principle. <laughs> Under the User Fee Act, yes, yes absolutely. Right. So, so first of all, that's one impediment. There are a lot of impediments that, that prevent us from going down this road. I think we'd like to do more in the 
value-based or outcome-based um, innovative contracting arrangement space. Um, what we can share is one impediment. Um, some of the other rules, for example, the current um, best price rules, ASP, the average sales price under Part B. If you look at our system, we have a regulatory system that was built to service a fee-for-service environment. And as we're trying to move into a value-based system, I think you've got to relook at some of those rules and see, you know, maybe revisit some of them and, and figure out what's working and what's not. But but let me also say that, you know. The Affordable Care Act and MACRA after that mm. was intended to move our system towards value. And I think the industry wants to be part of that conversation and is looking for ways to be part of that conversation. So um, so I think it's good we're having this conversation today. I think in, that's exactly what we want to do. In the last few minutes before I go to the audience, which I want to do, Henry, I want to ask you about the kind of turmoil and the, and the storms around the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and, and the failure to repeal, the failure to whatever, whether that uncertainty out there in that system matters to this discussion or not, or are they just completely different? Is the ecosystem of drug pricing and how we're um, seeing that evolve disconnected from these largest ma larger macro questions on, on health care policy? I want to follow the previous procedure. I'm going to answer a previous question, then I will answer Great. yours. Uh, the previous observation that you made, Steve, was uh, is uh, value-based pricing of drugs the answer? Hmm. The force of the numerical example I gave is a firm, no, it is not, because it leaves a vast middle ground within which actual drug pricing is going to occur, mm. and you have no guidance, really, as to where within that range prices should be set other than managerial discretion, mm. uh, some very inexact science, because this is not an area where we know the, the numbers that go into the equations. Uh, and the, so I think this leads me, at least, to a judgment that in the end, as drug development proceeds, and I fully expect miracles from Johnson & Johnson mm. and, and other drug companies over the coming years, I mean real, do you have miracles coming? Yes. Real, okay, real trans <laughs> things that are going to transform it's what it means to, to live a normal human life. Right. I mean, it's really profound stuff that I think is going to come. Uh, I think there's no way to avoid uh, the involvement of government, of public regulation, of this in some form, whether it is to bear part of the costs of development uh, and testing right. to make those public costs rather than private costs that have to be recovered mm -hmm. by the producers through higher prices, uh, or whether it's simple pr uh, price regulation that is going to come in some form. I don't really know. I stress, I think it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the ACA story, uh, we're in the midst of a very chaotic uh, process. Uh, Personally, I was skeptical from the beginning that the repeal and replace effort would succeed. Uh, it doesn't look very likely that it is going to succeed, but who can tell? Mm. Uh, it's anybody's guess. This was an attempt, the ACA, for better or for worse, to bring a kind of order into the uh, insurance market that didn't previously exist. It was the culmination of decades one could say almost a century of effort mm -hmm. uh, to reform the health care system. If it fails and crashes, if it is uh, replaced completely, I will say destroyed, it will make it, I think, impossible uh, to bring the kind of coordination <coughs> of policy to health care for a very long period of time. I am not suggesting and that, that includes the prescription. It drug includes. It, it's yeah. it's going to have all kinds of ramifications beyond the particular law itself. It's going to cast a shadow over public involvement in uh, all aspects of of health care policy. Uh, I'm not suggesting the Affordable Care Act is uh, a perfect act. Few people mm -hmm. who support it do, and I'm not suggesting that measures that would correct flaws that I might see have a chance of being enacted without recognizing the views of those who are generally opposed to the Affordable mm. Care Act. It's going to have to be a compromise process. The unfortunate aspect of the current debate 
is that there is so little indication of a willingness mm -hmm. to negotiate a compromise package of improvements and changes to the Affordable Care Act that I believe could give both parties something that they want. And I think that's something right. that uh, Gail would probably agree Gail with it from and, the other and Liz, side. Just as we wrap up here, because we just have about 45 seconds each, um, if you were to be super empowered and to be able to move the needle on any aspect of a more healthy pricing system within it, what would you think are the most important pieces to move, just short form? Uh, first of this comparative effectiveness research, knowing what works for whom, when, under what cir circumstances, is incredibly important as a backdrop. I have a little more confidence in the competitive pressures that PBMs can have uh, with regard to the uh, very strong pricing, pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical benefit, benefit manufacturer, thank you, that are I the large group. I love how healthcare group, has become so much like Pentagon talk. Yeah, <laughs> the large purchasing groups yeah. that are very effective, and we saw this especially in the hepatitis C drugs. Uh, uh, once you had AbV come on in the market, uh, the Savaldi Harvoni price dropped significantly. Um, I'm a little skeptical about uh, having the government get in there uh, with regard to the pricing. Henry was very careful of saying how you do this uh, is, um, uh, uh, is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. It is maybe in the development, maybe more in terms of the sponsorship. Uh, the government has never, at least HHS has never negotiated a price. Uh, it sets prices. Uh, when it sets prices wrong for uh, physicians or hospitals, it can fix them right away. Right. The problem, if it screws up in the pharmaceutical pricing, mm -hmm. you'll know it 10 years down the right. line. Liz, you helped sculpt this policy, and now you're in the private sector. What needles would you move to get a better, better pricing system in place than we have today? I mean, I guess thinking about ACA and, and the value-based pricing conversation that we're having, access to continuous coverage and access to coverage, I think it's really important. And if you look at one of the barriers to investing in or if you want to look at it, investing in therapies that might be more costly is, you know, you might not have those um, those enrollees at some point in time in a very mm -hmm. near future. I mean, the, so the so the more people have access to coverage that's continuous and um, consistent, I think um, furthers um, the ability to do value-based pricing and, and make those investments in the sort of therapies that help people in the way that we want to help people. Interesting place to end. Let me open the floor for comments, questions. Yes, right there in the back. Can we run a mic there? Anybody else need an 8 a.m. drug? <laughs> Hi, thank you all for being here. Tara Hayes with the American Action Forum. Tell us Forum. who you are. Tara Hayes, American Action Forum. Um, my question, Dr. Walensky, um, you mentioned in a Daraprim Turing um, type scenario that one solution could be to have the government actually pay for a competitor to come in and enter the market, um, which is very interesting, but it raises Two questions for me. Um, one, what should the government pay? Um, what percentage of the cost maybe should they cover? Um, and then on the flip side, you know, the reason they've entered the market is because presumably in that situation it signals that the government believes the company is charging too much, which is obviously a subjective um, point. But so then what right. should that company that they've now paid to enter the market, what should they be allowed to charge and should they have to pay back some of that money that they were given? And can I just piggyback on your excellent question? When we talk about drug pricing, one of the things I have learned from reading vast amounts of material in the last week over this is that you've got the front drug, but the question is what all's in that price? So, you know, if, if Heather Bresch is saying an EpiPen, they get $274 out of a $600, there's $326 that's another part of that, that price that's out there. So I'm just, I just want to sort of look at whether we're looking at the holistic price, meaning all the component pieces, or we're looking at what just the you know, front end piece of that, which that particular drug company puts out, because I think that's a legitimate part of the question. But go ahead, Gail. The, um, the example I gave was is in a relatively limited case where you are not talking about breaking patents, because I think that's a very dangerous road to go, go down. Uh, but in the case where you have a generic that is a very small market that has been ignored by everybody except one producer, uh, you could have basically the threat of government will subsidize a second producer to come in on this limited market on the generic side, on the generic side for these very limited, spectacularly bad actors that we've heard about 
in the last few years. So as a company buys a drug, you know, 10,000, 50,000 users, but very important users, uh, long off patent, it, I would is, hope the is that threat... Could that work? Because as I understand it, there's a huge backlog of generic approval right now. Well, that, that's another issue. And one of the things that, uh, that FDA uh, needs to do, we'll see because of the 21st Century Cures Act that was just passed that mm. put in more money in both NIH and uh, FDA, whether that helps get rid of the generic backlog. Right here. Hi, Mike Miller. Um, can you sit? Is that all right? Um, I'm a longtime health policy physician. I've been working on these issues now for almost 30 years, and I appreciate Henry Aaron's uh, numerical example. I'm a longtime fan of him, Gail, and all you guys. But I think that's really a, an economic retrospective look at, at how the investments work and how analysts will look at it. For companies, it's a prospective thing. Mm -hmm. and they're working in a highly regulated, complicated, multi-chain environment. And my experience and insight is that they set prices like every other industry to maximize their net income. Mm -hmm. And they set the prices as best they can. And, and like a lot of other right. modeling and projections, they get it wrong a lot. So to think that, you know, there's a mystique out there, the company set a price and they penny, you know, nail it down to the dollar and it's exact and it, it's, you know, perfect uh, assessment um, isn't true. Um, so I think we need Mike. to be careful looking at, it, at current income as paying back investment in R&D. It's the current income pays for future R&D. It's not like they've got a banker they've got to pay back or, or the guy's going to come break their leg. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So we're right at the end of the session. We've got to end. But I want to um, take just a few seconds of each of you either in response to Mike or your final thought on what we can do to sort of improve the game. Liz? I guess I'll say I don't think it's always set to maximize profit. And, and maybe if there's any Wall Street analysts out there, then, then maybe I'm going to cause other problems. But there is, a, <laughs> there is a, a, an aspect of access. If you're setting prices that um, nobody can have access to the drug that, or, or that you're going to impact negative your reputation or you know companies are really in it for the long run and Johnson & Johnson has been around for 130 years and intend to be there for another 130 we've got to think about a lot of other factors besides just can we maximize the profit in this one case for this one drug you know for this one time because you've mm -hmm. got to think about sort of a number of other factors thank so I guess you. I disagree with that thank you Henry uh, I'm glad to hear what uh, Liz just said and I believe it is true every drug uh, company executive wants to go home at night and sleep well and feel that he or she has served the public interest. Uh, that said, uh, they also do have to serve mm -hmm. uh, shareholder interests, and those interests are not always aligned. Right. Gail? The question is going to be, how do we mimic the effects of competition uh, in an area where the government needs to grant a monopoly on some of the most important drugs? Uh, these are hard questions. I think you saw the three of us struggle with trying to be specific how you weigh off the upsides and the downsides uh, of direct government intervention in an area that requires uh, uh, innovation. I want to thank Gail Walensky, Henry Aaron, and Elizabeth Fowler so much for helping us struggle through these issues. They're obviously highly consequential uh, that so many people have showed up uh, yeah. this morning here, but I think also uh, it's, it's really captured national attention in terms of how this evolved forward. So thank the three of you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.